to Thursday evenings like that. But we get to have conversations with amazing people who are doing great things for Mother Ghana. And tonight I have one such inspirational story for you. One such amazing guest for you. You would love to listen to him right here. So from now to 8 o'clock, make sure you're stuck here. You can actually get on Facebook. We're live on Facebook. You can see the video on Facebook. You can share it and let people, you know, tune into this conversation that we're about to have. My guest is awesome. Really awesome, honestly. I spent time with uh, a brother who has defied all odds, risen through the ranks. He's a teacher by profession. Spent years imparting knowledge into people. He's been a strong advocate for persons living with disabilities. And on several occasions, he's called for their inclusion in government. Well, today, it will be safe to say he's living the dream. One of his dreams, actually. He's the second person with disability to be appointed as a Ghanaian minister. Please help me welcome the minister of the T region, Honorable Joshua Makubu. Welcome, Chairman. Thank you very much. Really good you. to see you. I'm excited that you're here. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited you've given me this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. How are you yeah. doing? How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. And the people of OT region are doing very well. Awesome. I know a lot of them are tuned in <laughs> and they're excited uh, to hear you on Joy FM today. Yeah. Uh, so good evening to our friends who are listening live from the OT region, those who are tuned in online as well. Well, our Honorable Minister is here. <laughs> and this white, white, what was the occasion? Um, it, it, was it just a you know a pick from the wardrobe or yeah, you are celebrating the, something? No, 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 there's no <laughs> nothing I'm celebrating. But to me, every day is a blessing. Every okay. minute it needs to be celebrated, awesome. no matter what other circumstances might have come here. We still need to celebrate the fact that you are alive. That's very yeah. true. That's very well. You actually set the tone for a good conversation because <laughs> I like the way you are actually inspiring us already from the set go. Um, you have a an interesting middle name. I've been trying hard to pronounce it. I didn't want to ask you in person. I wanted you to actually teach us how to pronounce it on air. Okay. Uh, what is it? It's Mayenam. Mayenam. Yes. Mayenam. Yes. Did I get it right? Yeah. What does it mean? Right. Um. Let me tell you the story. Uh -huh. When my dad and my mom got married, they had first two kids. They were guys. They all died the same day. Wow. Then when my sister was born, then they said, Asasia san, there's no land anymore to bury anybody. So she survived. So the next child of my mom, then they said, Mungobar, now I'm also a king. Now I have two kids. When I couldn't get one, now I'm a king. Okay. Then the third born, then my grandmother said, ah, if the earlier two had uh, existed mm -hmm. with additional two, then we were not the same to Bangmala. Then when I was born, finally also a guy, then my grandmother once again said, Mayin Nam. Actually, if you want to say it fully, it's Mabayin mm Nam. -hmm. Like if all of them were alive, okay. but this time who does the kingdom belong to again? It means that the kingdom would have been solidified. Wow. If all were alive. <laughs> My name. Yes. Oh, what a story. <laughs> I, I knew there was something to it. I'm glad I actually asked. Yeah, Thank yeah. you so much for explaining uh, that. It's a name I'm so passionate about. Yes, yes. I try to write it at the least of which. Even though people find it difficult pronouncing it, but I always try to make sure it's part of okay. whatever I write. No, that's good. I'm actually glad we talked about the name because I, I saw it and I realized, no, this is quite, this is not an ordinary name. Yeah. It has a story behind it. Yeah. And I'm glad you have shared it with us here on personality profile on Joy 99.7 FM. So earlier I mentioned that this could be one of your dreams coming true. Would you say same? Yes, obviously. I'm someone who has always lived a life uh, such that I want people to trace my resource to me and not tracing me to my resource. So as an advocate, uh, I have always wished that at a point in time, Persons with disabilities are included. Mm -hmm. We should move from that part of tokenism to a level where we can talk of the meaningful involvement mm -hmm. of all facets of Ghanaian society, irrespective of one's social status or the status of one's ability. So to show that I am doing well, I want to see the results out there. Fortunately, unfortunately, that bad time came on me. So yes, 
personally, I feel fulfilled mm -hmm. that I have been able to move. But again, I also feel that look, what we have been championing, get persons with disability there, uh, it's, it's, it's a dream that has also come true. Yeah. Even though it's giving me an additional burden to justify why I was always asking for the inclusion. Okay. And, and is, is that a tougher ask? No, it's not a tougher act, but it's something that has to be worked through cautiously okay. and with a high level of commitment. Mm. Was there a point that you actually felt this dream wasn't going to happen? Oh, yeah. Politically, there were times I felt like, look, do I have to just back out? And it, it all started uh, in 2009 mm -hmm. when I wanted to be a constituency. Uh, chairman, I was in level 100 at KUSD by then. Oh, wow. Yes, and mm -hmm. if you look at the manner in which the election was conducted mm -hmm. and the kind of financial support from some people at the top my uh, contender got, if I got a bit of that, I would have given him a serious beating. <laughs> but he was a very lovely brother. May his soul rest in peace. Uh, later on, he became my inspiration in politics. Mm. And... Yep, fast forward from 2009, I went back in 2014, this time not at the coincidence level, at the regional level. Mm. And then we won election. Then my first attempt at getting an appointment at the DC didn't work. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. At a point, I just needed to hang on to something. I wanted to go to the mass lock. That one didn't work. Uh, finally, it's uh, ahead of the 2020 election. We had a point in time where the president himself had consented that I'd be made the health insurance manager. Things didn't work out. So I asked myself, what is the problem? See, sometimes if you ask uh, Honorable Patrick Buama and he hasn't deleted that text message, I sent him a text message. Is there anything within our party which is generally accepted that persons with disability, no matter how hard they work and how hard uh, qualified they are, they shouldn't be elevated. Then he <laughs> sent me a message and said, No, there's nothing like that. It's about time. Continue. So at that moment, mm. yeah, guys like him were there. Yeah. And then when I look at the president himself and I remember his story, what. We had to go through, especially ahead of 2008. Yeah. And then after 2008, 2012, when people thought like, all hopes were lost, then at that moment, the Savior appeared. Yeah. So seriously, uh, there were times I felt that, look, maybe I was chasing over the wild wind. Man. Yeah. God in his own time will make things good in his own way. And indeed he did it. Oh, indeed he did. Wow, what a story. Let's get to know you better. Let's get to, let's start from the beginning. Where you hail from, where grandmom, who, <laughs> who made this beautiful story, uh, hails from. Where, where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I was born in a village in the Nanumba North Municipality called Dimona mm. Yeah, to my parents who were partly farmers and partly traders. So I grew up in the Monaili, where I had my basic education up to the primary level. Mm -hmm. But I uh, had to leave to join my auntie and uncles in Damanko, the then Volta North, and now part of Oti region, then Guantanamo, North, because of the 1992-94 disturbances in the North and the desire of my uh, auntie to perpetuate my father's dream of getting me educated. Okay. She brought me to come and stay with her. So That's in the OT, OT yeah, in the region. OT region. Okay. So I grew up in Namangu where I finished my basic uh, education, mm. went to SHS, came back and started people teaching there. So what was it that uh, was it that your auntie was better placed to get you educated? Yeah, but what happened is that where my father was, there was war there. Okay. So access to education was not possible. Mm. But in that mountain, but it was relatively peaceful. Schools were in session. Mm. There were teachers and other things. So that was the only way I can access education by then. But was it for, was it a privileged home? Oh, not really. Uh, when we started, my father himself was doing quite well. Okay. What but, was he into uh, at the time? He was into trading and then farming as well. Okay. Okay. And he was a chief too. 
Oh, okay. Uh -huh. oh. So I've been telling people that me, I've passed through uh, most of the life cycle. If it is a time where as a child you see money, I saw money. There was a time I asked myself, how can somebody say because of money he can't go to school? They should go ask that gentleman if indeed he passed his papers. He came to teach us uh, extra classes mm -hmm. and they were like, he has passed his sixth form, he could go to the university but there was no money. And at that time, <laughs> it would have been very stupid. Excuse me, my language, someone telling me that uh, you had the papers and because of the government, that made me understand if it has to do with money, then I was going to get whatever education I wanted. But when the conflict happened, mm -hmm. he lost everything that he had. And there were times you wake up in the morning and the only thing you can get it was to go to the stream side, dig deep to you meet the soil that was a bit cold. You lick it and get onto the stream and take some water. And Are you serious? So moving from that level. So when we got to the village where my father ran to the People were asking their kids not to come closer to us, simply because they felt that my dad had used money to train us, and now that there was no money, we were going to be stealing from people, and they don't want their kids to be thieves. That was the kind of discrimination we got. What? No, no, no I'm, I'm curious. You said w with the food bit, you had to go to the stream. Yeah. And, and do what? Like, dig what? You dig... At the stream, mm -hmm. see, when you dig down, yeah. you get to a point where the soil there will be very cold. Uh -huh. Yeah, and a bit moist. You fetch it, you can lick it. Now, when you take water, it can take you to the evening. When you come, at least something will be there for you to eat. Holy I've ever done that. Moly. Yeah, I've ever done that. My first time of eating snake was during the conflict period. Not because I desired to eat snake. We have not seen snake before. Nobody has ever cooked snake. But they say it's a snake that when you eat, uh, you'll be satisfied. <laughs> when we killed it, we took it home and we prepared it. and then we, uh, It was nice, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so, you are reminiscing uh, the yeah, delicacy. It has not been easy, and that is a bit people don't get. Those who know my father from the beginning, and even during the trying moment when we're trying to go to school, mm -hmm. uh, they still sit down and they feel that we have for this one. There's money in the house, but money was in the house. It got finished, and we just have to work hard. I go to raise the amounts on my clutches. That if you go to that man going today, you ask for one Kotokuli man, he's called Fairy. Mm -hmm. Then you ask uh, yeah, one woman at Baduli, Ikeyo, then uh, Major in that man. They gave me the opportunity to work on their farms to be able to raise some few CDs for my extra classes yeah. and to also buy yeah. pamphlets, uh, even in this condition. So it has not been that smooth. Uh, that's that's interesting. Uh, and, and and at a time, did you know what was happening? Did you understand what was going on with your family? Yeah, I understood perfectly what was going on with my family. I'm someone that my dad speaks to a lot. And he tells me things that some people at times felt that no, I was too young for that. But my father would speak to me in very hard and challenging ways. Mm. Yeah, very hard and challenging way. So uh, when he told me that, when my auntie was bringing me, so like, Joshua, he calls me Openi. Mm -hmm. yeah, Joshua, Openi, uh, I know. Someone who has gone to fetch fire and quenches one day. When he goes back and he fetches fire, he will be able to what, carry it to its destination. So we should relax and give him some time. Mm. He will come back again. And then there will be money at home for us to go to school. And I remember that I told him that, Dad, I know you have done your best. Let us go. And whatever it is, we will not let you down. Mm. This was the, the party you were going to your auntie. Yeah, when I was going to my auntie at that time, that age. So we would say that things got a little better with auntie's place, right? Oh, yeah. When I got to my auntie, to be very frank, she stood by me and the basic needs. Mm -hmm. I was a bit troublesome because of the statement my father made. Mm -hmm. There were times I would need certain things and I would not tell her. I would get out there, mm. try to get those things for myself. 
How? That's just us laboring on people's farms. So I'll make sure that I go to farm for people that she will not hear that okay. I, I, I was there. I remember when we were going to ride the BEC, and the boy, she felt that if she should prepare the shito herself for me, I would tell her uh, oh, there will not be any need for her. When she prepared the shito, she gave it to someone who was also going to ride. When we got to the place, the person gave it to me. My auntie said, this is my shito, this is my guy, and other thing. For the one week we stayed to ride the BEC, she's someone who was so passionate mm. and would do everything at the same time to she didn't want to engage me a lot for me to remember uh what had happened yeah yeah uh, so she was very careful and as an educationist mm -hmm. she knew when to strike wow and, and, and so things were a bit better what did all this teach you around the time all those things that you were going through um from dad to your auntie and manning up at a very young age and and, and, and growing up by force, if I can put it that way, what, what did they all teach you? Yeah, um, when I look back and some of the lessons I made from that is that at any point in time, even in the midst of uh, well wishes, try to do things on your own. Learn to be independent. Learn to be self-reliant because there are people you see around they are able to help because they are capable. And tomorrow, when it is not possible, your future should not be ruined because what someone has established has mm -hmm. been ruined. So at that moment, I felt that, yes, uh, I should do something for myself, even though my dad was there and now I'm with my auntie. Mm -hmm. And at that tender age, Coming to live with my auntie, who was educated compared to my parents, who didn't have education. My auntie's house were very few. My father's place were many. So I also learned to be able to blend mm. that kind of having a very small family where communal living is yeah. not the order of the day. At my auntie's place, we don't put our hands in the same bowl, but at my dad's place, we come around and we yeah. eat together. Everybody was a brother, everybody was a sister. So I thought that, yes, you need to learn to be independent. And when the environment changes, you don't have to be living in your past. You just have to quickly adjust, accept their realities, and see what you can do out of the situation. And that was exactly what uh, we did. Wow. You've got an amazing story already. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Uh, yeah. But I learned that your, your leg got amputated when you were about eight or nine years. Yeah, I went to the hospital at age eight. And then <laughs> came out of the hospital after uh, 13 months, by which time I was nine years when the amputation was done. Why did you go? What took you to the hospital? Yep, I had a defective knee from birth. You okay. know, because my mom was trading, I was always with my sister. So when I got a, a tumor growing on my knee, and we did it, my sister was the one who was able to explain that when I was growing up, whenever. She was bathing me, and then she touched my knee. I, I, I cried. I mm -hmm. said there was some sharp pain, so that thing happened. It got to a point, it became a serious issue. Then my dad took me to the hospital, Yendi Government Hospital, to see if they could work on the tumor. Unfortunately, the surgery was performed. The surgery was not successful. It led to uh, excessive bleeding. Mm. And we were discharged. We came home. We were going to Bimbla for the wound to be dressed. And it was rather... Uh, increase it was not going and so one day uh, I fainted and uh, the narration I went into coma and then when I became regained consciousness my dad insisted I be sent to the Mango government hospital and God works in a very amazing way mm. I don't know what happened that very day my dad and my mom were the people who went with me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Unlike the previous time, they would either call an uncle, a brother to go with a sister or go with my mom. So if it had been that case, when we got there, then the doctor said, if they didn't work on my leg and I was allowed to bleed for another 24 hours, uh, it was going to be bad news. Mm. But because mom and dad were there, they quickly consented and then, uh, I was sent the to surgery. The act that yeah. your leg be amputated. Yes, uh, I was sent to surgery straight away, mm. and then they work on it. Yeah, the first stitching 
he don't work well. When they remove the stitch, the tissue pulled back. So I sent to the theater again. Then another stitching was done. Had to be there for another three months for that one to, to be opened and to go to a point. That was not easy. That sounds yes, yes. horrific. Yeah. But that's what I went through. Did you understand what it meant at that time? No, at that time, what I only knew was that I'd lost a leg. I didn't know how it was going to feel like in society, how I was going to feel like when I want to do something for myself. Now, at our hospital, there was this nurse, Sister Kate. She would always come when she was off duty, asked my mom to go, and then she would be with me. And I was a white lady too. When I started getting better, she normally brought some of these toys that has been picture that has been cut into pieces, mm -hmm. then spread them, and then I will have to fix them to get yeah. the original picture. But so she developed some serious interest in it. So even when we were being discharged, and then uh, I was given the elbow clutches. When she came, she was mad. She took the elbow clutches away and gave me uh, the armpit clutches. Sorry. The armpit ones, yeah, okay. She took them away and brought me the elbow clutches. So if not because of her, I would have been using the wooden elbow clutches. Uh. It would have also come with its own consequences. Oh, that also comes with its own consequences? Yeah, if you are using the elbow clutches, you look a bit presentable and confident okay. when you are going out as compared to... The armpit, the armpit one. ones. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> wow. So, my, in the hospital environment, I only knew the pain and then mm -hmm. maybe not having the, a leg and having to learn how to walk with a cord. Because when I came back to the house that I saw the reality staring at me, right in the face, mm -hmm. <laughs> it got to a point. My brother, uh, my elder brother, Thomas, who used to carry me on the bicycle to school, they tell me, look, when we pass and they turn and they are looking at you to turn and you'll be <laughs> looking at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the kind of thing, right? Charlie, you had to It didn't crazy. feel good. It didn't feel good. It was so much uh, demoralizing, you know. Mm. Moving forward was not uh, easy. But then again, my dad would always tell me, Joshua, if you need money and money is on the horns of a bull, I'll go get it for you. Mm. When my money finished, I know those who owe your grandfather. I'll demand their death for them and I'll take you to school. Okay. He stood by me. Yeah. And he tried to do you no know, in my trivia, I was like, my dad was someone who knew how to make the weakest of his children the strongest mm -hmm. in the house. Okay. Yeah. He made sure that yeah, there was this store that I was assigned to. So at all times, I had money. So those siblings who have met up towards me will come to me for money. And that <laughs> subdued them. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. That, that, that was it. And that was also good for me. Yeah. I learned how to give from uh, the very, very early age. Uh, early age. Yeah. You know, when we were much younger, they would ask you what you want to be when you grow up. Yes. What was your answer to that question? Actually, my answer to the question was, I wanted to be a medical doctor or a bank manager. Mm. So, when I went to SHS and I studied science, came out of school, and somewhere along the line, something happened, I had to abandon the science and go for the applied science. I ended up in the finance department. I didn't understand. It was just a few years ago that I was working from the University of Ghana Business School towards Volta Hall. Mm -hmm. Then it played back. I said, ah, you see that the finance I'll be doing today, I'm doing today was what I saw and said I want to be a bank manager. That was the finance uh, uh, destined or what. Well, I'd lost the dream of being a medical doctor. Uh, you said something I, happened. What happened? I just couldn't continue with the sciences. Um, when I applied for this laboratory technology at Kolebu after SHS. The day of interview came, I went there with Senior Slim, uh, Philemon, and a certain guy was detailed to come and take our original certificates. So when he was speaking the certificate, he got to my turn. He stopped, and I said, 
are you sure you can do the course you wait let me go and find out so he went in before coming back to take my uh, this and so uh, what, what, what was that about it was because of my disability because of your disability yes and that's why he yeah, asked whether the, yeah, are you lab, sure yeah the love you have to be holding uh, flags and I, don't know. I did chemistry we did chemistry practical physics practical biology practical mm. i was able to do that so in fact i was completely demoralized and that was where uh, i made an attempt to leave and since i philemon asked that we stayed so the interview was conducted and really i can't even remember what i said when i got there because my spirit had already yeah uh, gone so i had to eventually enroll for uh, an hnd in statistics that very year mm. uh, yeah in whole poly from there i went to tech to do the actual science and that is where i am today so i really wanted to be a medical doctor because i felt that I was saved and I need mm -hmm. to save. And it just took one person's yeah. brief to, statement yeah, to get me out of the sciences. To break that dream. Yeah, yeah it's not been easy, but uh, must that's have, how far we have come. Must have, I, I'm just trying to imagine how you felt that moment when he uh, asked you whether you were I, sure. I, I yeah. felt very bad. Yeah. I felt very bad. People don't see me crying, but I cry a lot. Mm. Yes, I cry a lot. That's me. I allow myself to cry, and then I get the energy, and then I move on. I reckon you get a lot of these retorts quite often. Yeah, they are, they are quite often. Uh, people always dis uh, discourage you that they feel that with your condition and you have gotten this uh, mm. you should stay and then focus when the social welfare officer told me when i was just sort of moving from the ghs to shs that i should go and learn tailoring i was like why mm. why why should that be so because i have a disability you can't even look at my results and then encourage me to do something then at a point, my first election I wanted to contest was after the election. And when I made mention of uh, by you two, that was a, yeah, that the, the statement a colleague made. Mm -hmm. So I had to rescind that decision. And this was on KNUC campus? No, uh, Hopoli campus. Hopoli, okay. And then later <laughs> in life, when I had to go to work in, in Quanta South, as a district employment coordinator. By the time I got there, some people had expressed mixed feelings. Yeah, the guy, uh, Yari for, uh, how will he be able to go around? And, uh, and they were genuine feelings because they didn't know how I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I like such people in that particular instance. When I got there, through the effort of the current uh, chief of staff, she was a minister for uh, employment and then manpower. And then she insisted. And then I got there. And the same people, after some three months, actually gave a recommendation for me to be made a government appointee. And I had to, my DC at that time, Honorable Joseph Yabuka, then they had to make two people step down for me to contest to become a presiding member. Mm. Because he had gotten convinced that I could do the job. Mm. And that was where the politics started. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes um, those things are there. Yeah. You want to aspire and people feel that, look, uh, a person with that you have gotten a degree. So why do we, what do we need a master's degree for? And they say, hey, with your condition, you need to get settled and then put up your own house, start to get work. You want to go and do PhD, you know you are not. And I said, look, let me do. So long as the breath of the Lord is in me, let me fight until I get to a point that I cannot fight and I say, I am coming back. So those remarks are there. Mm. Yeah, those remarks are there. Have you, have you gotten to the point where it doesn't affect you or it doesn't get to you? Uh, well, your hobby is crying, but <laughs> have you got to the point where they won't make you cry? 
No, I, I, it got to a point uh, I capitalized on my disability. Like we go in for a political context and then you are my opponent. Then you go telling the people that, oh, because of my disability, I will not be able to do that. By the time you get there to say it, I would have said it myself. Mm. I would have told them what the worries of people are and what I'll be able to do. My first regional elections in the... Uh, in voter region, mm. when they gave us five minutes each to talk, and then people came and saying what they would do, what they do not. Do. I got there and I told them, Look, I'm not here to tell you what I can do. I want to tell you who I am, what I have done. Then you decide whether I can do this job. So I concluded my uh, speech by telling them in every Atia de Menye, Nyemecha, Kuga, Keme, Dovo, Vulina, Nyefo, Meto, I am a tree. I might not bear fruit, but I know for sure I'll provide shade for my people. Mm -hmm. And that is me. You put me somewhere, if you fruit you want, if I'm not able to give you the fruit, I for the shade, I'll give you. Wow. And when I made this statement, like the next person contested me when he was called and he mounted the stage. For close to uh, two minutes, he didn't know where to start and where yeah. to, to, to end. That's uh, quite a profound statement, yeah, i got to be yeah, honest. And, and, and. So it got to a point, look, anything you say about disability would never move me because I had accepted the situation. Mm -hmm. I had gotten an antidote to any deficiency that mm, the absence of a second leg would have caused me. And I had made amendments. Alternatives were there. Mm. Yes, you have two legs. You cannot pass your wasi. Then I have my wasi. So why should you insult me and I will be hurt? Yes, you have a degree. You have, if you like, have four legs. I get to see me. I'm done with a degree. I'm done with my master's. I'm almost getting done with my PhD. Then you think you will say I'm a person with disability and I'll be worried. Come on. I don't think uh, that, is, that is necessary. So I've always been telling persons with disability, yes, you have a situation. I accept it. But what is your backup? Hmm. What is the alternative? What would people look at? And even referring to your disability will not come. And most of my colleagues, when we are talking about that, they ask me, Anna, also who can home? <laughs> are you also part of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, your, your story is totally amazing. Uh, a lot of people are tuned in and watching us live on uh, Facebook as well. I would love to read some of the messages uh, in here. If you're listening to us live on Joy 99.7 FM, you can go onto our Facebook page. The live video is on there. This evening, I'm spending time with the Honorable Minister for the OT region, uh, Joshua Makubu. Uh, let me mention the name. My Nam. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. the that's the, the middle name. A very, a very interesting name. Uh, Yohi B. Koko on our Facebook page says, how do you manage with mobility in Ghana as there are no disability access in almost everywhere uh, in Ghana? Secondly, is he doing anything about access for disabled people in Ghana? Okay. Um, Babai Gilbert says, I'm watching Honorable Live from the Uti Regional Capital, Dambai. We love you so much. Uh, Edward Yelenge says, uh, my hardworking minister, you're a great Asset to the people of OT and Kunkumba land. Okay. And SK Santiago says, I should tell you, you are one of the reasons I don't give up easily in life. Yeah. I mean, your story is very inspirational. Um, Yohi asked uh, how you manage with mobility in Ghana mm -hmm. since there are no disability access in almost everywhere in Ghana. And are you doing anything about access for disabled people in Ghana? <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, the project I led in 2016, the election project, okay. was all about access, where the blind can vote without anyone uh, <laughs> voting for them, where in situation, some situation, they may even vote for people they don't want. We mm -hmm. made sure that polling stations were accessible, we had to engage the EC, and, other, and then I was part of... Um, the advocacy team that also work on the Ghana accessibility standards that are currently there. So, after what we can do, we have done. But the issue of implementation 
is 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 a problem. Mm. Is 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 a challenge. The persons with disability at Act Seven One Five, Two Thousand and Six, uh, they talk about access to uh, public spaces, and uh, a ten-year mm. moratorium was given. But you see, houses that are being put up now, and they still don't have uh, it. There was a time I was uh, listening to an interview with the former Minister of Education, Professor Nana Opukwa Jiman, on this uh, accessibility. You see that the uh, community day schools, those that, uh, that were put up by World Bank, mm -hmm. they have ramps. But those that were put up by the Ghanaian taxpayer, they don't have ramps. So someone was asking her, uh, so in that case, how does that cater for mm. persons where it was like the labs and other things are on the ground floor? And the question was, so if someone is in first year and is on the ground floor, second year, the person will have to continue. Mm -hmm. So if the third year class is on the uh, last floor, what happens? And then it's like, so I was like, no, I cannot remain in one particular class for three good years. The environment, I'll become so used to it. And mm -hmm. I ask myself, why? And it will refer to because I'm a person with this. That is already what dehumanizing. So we have been talking about it. We've been doing our best. Mm -hmm. But the lack of the political will to enforce that particular aspect of the disability. And Ghana has signed on to and ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And this access, uh, mobility, and it, it is there. Okay. But no one is actually, new buildings are being put up and no one is uh, thinking about it. The last I said, the Ministry for Gender and Social Protection. That has to take care of persons with disability. If you are in a wheelchair, how do you get to the top? You go to the ministry, then you have the Greek ministry, the employment ministry. They have uh, ramps. So if other ministries have been able to do it, why can't we do it for others? Mm. It's just about the education and then the willpower. And this time we don't have to wait. Mm. We have to work to ensure that the laws are enforced, fines are given, and then maybe when you are doing it without the access, the, the way they write, uh, mm -hmm. produce permits, uh, stop work, and uh, they should be able to indicate stop work because there's no ramp. Mm -hmm. So what she said is, is really true. And what is even uh, worrying are the artificial uh, inaccessibility they create on our campus. You go to University of Ghana, uh, the business with the, uh, the graduate campus, you get to say, tax is not allowed beyond this point. You go to tech, it is there like that. And then you just imagine the place is sunny, and then a person with the is on board a taxi and has to get there and then has to alight. So because some people don't even try to assess mm. it. So I feel that those ones, yes, for some security reason, taxes are not allowed beyond certain point. But why wouldn't you just add, except taxes with persons with disability on board? Yeah. And in an academic environment, it should be easier to even give such people tax. Mm. But it's like nobody really cares. Now, now you are closer to the corridors of power. How yeah. do you assess the feasibility or the implementation or the will of, 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 of government to enforce these things? Yeah, I think, uh, seriously speaking, uh, that people, is, uh, Ghanaians, when you interact with them, you get opportunities, you make an informal conversation, then you get the people to understand. Uh, I can tell you that all the youth resource centers that have been put up mm -hmm. uh, in Ghana now, uh, issues of accessibility was very key. Uh, when I got to uh, who the uh, OT, the OT Regional Coordinating Council structure that is being put up, uh, it, it has a, what they call it, a structure for the lift. Okay. So when the contractor government ah, so the structure is there, but we're not intending to put the lift in it now. Mm. But with this, I think we have to do that immediately. Mm. So I was telling him that, yes, it's not only in the case of what? OT region where the minister is a person with disability. In any other coordinating council, yeah. persons with disabilities are also Ghanaians. They are entitled to assess their ministers. They are entitled to assess other offices and documentation. So those things should be done. I think... 
uh, as we get closer and added, and I'm still an advocate. The fact that I'm part of government doesn't mean I think my presence in government should even help government to appreciate some of these things yeah. and how we we'll do it. But there are quite a good number of guys out there who have uh, understanding now and then in their own small way um, they are working. Good now, stuff. we still need to continue to push. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'm so I'm so happy. I'm I'm happy because a lot of people are sending messages on our uh, Facebook live live video, okay. and enjoying the conversation, saying they're inspired by your story. I just got a message on our WhatsApp platform. You can also join us on WhatsApp if you want to send in a message or ask a question on zero five five one 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 nine nine seven. Doctor Joseph Brinyas Mening in Nejeso. Says Lexus, the interview with OT Regional Minister is the best in your career. <laughs> Thank you. I am touched and impressed. I'm glued to my radio and I want to get in touch with him. Um, uh, is there a way he can get in touch with yeah, you? Yeah, I'll leave my number. You give it to you. Okay, all right, good. Um, disability is not inability. Uh, stop the discrimination, people. Stop killing human dreams. And that's from Saada. Uh, on our Facebook page. In Dembe Meshak says, Honorable Makubi, in fact, the whole Konkomba fraternity is part of you. You motivate me a lot. I wish I could meet you in person. Uh, it's from Meshak, who's in Afram Plain South. Okay. And uh, Nabin Pascalin says, You are an inspiration to we the youth in OT. God bless you for what you are doing from uh, Pascaline. You can also get on our Facebook page and join the live video. You can share it as well so people can uh, also see this great conversation and the thoughts of this great man that I have in the studio today. So what really influenced your decision to get into politics? <laughs> All right. Um, growing up, my uncle, Honorable Joseph Kukunayan, was into politics. He became the assembly member a presiding member, mm. and then uh, eventually contested to be the member of parliament from Quantan North. He won on two occasions, 2004 and 2008. But then we were being used to do the errands, uh, this uh, polling agent, you stand at the ballot box for him, watch over things, and then when there's a need to go and talk to someone, we'll go back. I didn't really appreciate, uh, what do you call it, uh, politics. Mm -hmm. But when I got to Nkwanta as a district employment coordinator, I saw some in, I don't want to say injustices, imbalances. Mm. Yeah, you get to some communities, the community could be large, but probably because they didn't have anybody to talk for them. They don't have school buildings, they don't have access to it, and water was even a problem. You get to another place, the population is nowhere near Mm. The other that they have school buildings from primary school through Jesus and teachers contest and I was like, what is the problem? So I started doing my five final I that look, you didn't actually have people who would speak for them. So that was my motivation to become the mouthpiece of those who are not heard. Mm. Uh, so I made the appeal that I want to be part of the assembly to also carry out some of these uh, uh, views and then to that Ar place. around the time you never heard that politics was a dirty game oh no you, well you you heard it i heard that politics was a dirty game the fact that i even started life as a catechist in the catholic church i didn't actually want to do the politics but uh, what i saw the people going through yeah actually i don't want that there's something people don't know apart from sherry and chillinga that i have not been to any other village in Nguanda, I went to come to the Intribu side, uh, Bontibo, uh, Pusupu, Empire, or Ando, Jigbe, and all those things that have mm. been there. Then you go through the Kechebi Road, Adam Akra, Nawe, and other it, People think it was uh, inaccessible. I went there on a the motorbike, cars cannot go. Mm. Uh, motorbike was, but me miss, and then you see that people really want others to tell their story for them to be attended to. So that was how I got into uh, politics. politics. I remember I even asked someone, a cousin of mine, <laughs> that look, I can see that you like politics, but this group of people need a leader. 
Why won't you move from where you are and join them and provide that kind of leadership? And he was not too comfortable with us. Okay, I got to a point I was not getting him, and I decided to move it. And backed by Honorable Joseph Dente at that time, I, I went in for the presiding member slot. And I saw the way people were coming to mm. me. So there were even times when I made a statement that um, I for politics, I think I should stop. Then uh, one uh, electoral area coordinator, I said, ah, what? Do I just show? Okay, we are. Not, yeah, yeah, then when Tina said, yes, we are about politics, when to which I are, then it means say, yes, we are, and I said, well, come on. That's not what I'm talking about. So sometimes <laughs> you wish to even stop, yeah. but those who look up to you, they keep pushing you. Did so, you? Did you lobby for your appointment as Minister of the OT region? I say this to the glory of God. It is only His Excellency Nanado Dankwa Ekufado and the God He serves who knew how He made that decision to get me to be the Minister for OT region. I did my work as the OT Regional Secretary. I was part of every uh, campaign arrangement. I went to the hinterlands uh, where I need to even give my clutches to someone. Then I'll sit on a, st a stick and then crawl through to the other side to go and do my work. I did it. But maybe somebody was watching. Mm. And the day I got myself convinced that I can be a regional minister, if I get the regional that I want to be, and I took my CV and handed it over to the original chairman to express my intention. It took less than three days, and I got the information that I had been nominated. I had not spoken to anybody uh, about it. People I wanted to talk to I had not even gotten access. If you want, uh, again, let me refer you to Honorable Patrick Boama. I sent him a text when I wanted to meet him. Because at that point, I felt that he was the only one who understands my condition and politics at that time. Mm. But I didn't know that the president was watching from afar. Wow. So if they talk about lobbying, maybe I, I'm here to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Sam Bannerman says, Lexus, I'm watching the interview with the minister. is very touching and I'm enjoying it. I am too. Yeah. i got to be honest with you. Uh, you have an HND in statistics, a BSc in actuarial science, an MPhil in finance, and you're just about bagging a PhD in finance. You're yeah. driven. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks. This is really inspiring. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's more coming here. There's <laughs> more coming, actually. <laughs> uh, I've just joined the Global Association of Rigs Professionals. Wow. I'll be taking my first examination in November to charter as a Rigs Professional. Wow, that's very impressive. Uh, life has taught you a lot. What's the biggest lesson? <laughs> the biggest lesson that life has taught me is that at any point in time, identify a problem and solve. Tomorrow you might not be there to solve that same problem. Mm. And if you focus so much on you to the extent that you can see what others need, one day all that you accumulate for yourself will not give you the happiness you want. Mm. The only happiness you get is when you see other people being happy because of you. It, 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 uh, seriously, you just get somewhere and somebody, excuse me, who has two legs will tell you that, look, will look up to you. You are my role model. Mm. Thank you very much. If not because of you, I wouldn't have been where I am. If not because of you, this would have happened. Then, like, that is fulfillment. Yeah. Real fulfillment. So life has taught me nothing is permanent and nothing is insurmountable. Anything you want to overcome and you are not able to overcome, then it means that if you overcome it, it will not mean anything to you. Mm. But that doesn't mean that okay. you should realize. What's your biggest fear? My biggest fear in this world is that someone's dream will be shattered because of my actions and inactions. That is what I fear. If I am losing it, I don't have a problem. But someone losing it because of my actions and inactions. So when I get up, the prayer I say is, God, help me to identify those who will need my help and give me the ability to be able to help them. Also help me that I will be identified 
but those I will need their help and help them to be able to help me. That is my prayer. So my fear is somebody not getting me because I have not done what I should have done. Very profound thoughts, got to be honest. Uh, good evening to Honorable Minister Joshua. This is Enoch Belafuni. Uh, in fact, I nearly cried when I heard him saying he does cry when he's alone. But in all aspects of things, God knows what he has for him to withstand these difficulties until this time. Strong man he is. God bless him. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. It's been great, great, great spending time with you. you really I've enjoyed nice. this conversation, and you are indeed a great man. Yeah. Um, finally, in just a minute, if you can share a word of advice with anybody who's listening, anything that you want to advise on. Okay. Um, what I want to tell the people listening to me and even people in OT region, when you see someone in a situation, don't let the situations make you look down upon them. Look up for what you can do mm. to at least to improve upon the person's what situation. And in cases where you cannot do anything, please don't do anything to let the person sink further. If you cannot lift the person up, at least allow the person to be at where he or she is. Good that stuff. is the only way you can be fulfilled. Amazing. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Great spending time with you here Thank on Personality you Profile. Much. Mayinam. Mm -hmm. Mayinam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> my name is Lexus. Well, thanks a lot to my team. Uh, we'll go for the news now. Uh, the video is live on Facebook. You can share the video or you can actually, you know, watch it again because there are some real good nuggets in there. MFI standing by with what's happening in news. Joy Headline News at 8. In this edition, Health Ministry says it has not paid any monies to middlemen.